The Acolyte Season 1 is finally done. We now have it in its full glory. So let's do a post-mortem. Break it down to see exactly what we have on our hands. <laughs> I can't act so I cast. Leslie Headland has said the germ of the idea that led to the Acolyte story, conflict between sisters. Now, personally, I would have avoided the whole good twin, bad twin cliche, but if we think about art as examining the human condition, a lot of people can relate to the difficulties of maintaining positive relationships with family members. We're off to a good start. Leslie Headland has also said she wanted to re-examine the assumption that the Jedi were good. She wanted to place her story at the end of Pax Republic, at the end of a thousand years of galactic peace. This is not a new idea. Headland and her writers are walking down a well-trod path. One example, 1964 film The Fall of the Roman Empire examines the exact same question. The Roman Empire had Pax Romanica, hundreds of years of stability and peace. And the film tries to pinpoint the exact moment the empire lost its way, leading to just a few generations later, complete collapse of the civilization. The film's pretty good, worth a watch. Alec Guinness, Christopher Plummer, Sophia Loren, what's there not to like? What caused the collapse of Pax Republic? What role did the Jedi play in that collapse? Had the Jedi become too rigid, too bureaucratic? Were they stagnating? Were they allowing corruption to seep in? Had they lost their way? What was the attitude of the average galactic citizen towards the Jedi? Were they no longer seen in a positive light? All good questions to be explored. This is where we start to get the first signs that Hedlund and her writers aren't operating in good faith. After episode 6, the one where Apothecary Dude says to Osha, feels good to hold it in your hand, doesn't it? And then shows her his junk. Hedlund has an interview with Collider where she reveals a little detail. The Jedi from the Acolyte aren't the same Jedi as depicted in Lucas's films. They're High Republic Jedi, a Disney creation. Disney Jedi operate under very different rules than Lucas's Jedi. The audience was never told that the Acolytes Jedi are different than Lucas's Jedi. We're meant to assume they're one and the same. Hedlund wants to tell a story about the Jedi being evil, but she changes the rules without telling anybody that the rules have been changed, set somebody up to fail, and then condemn them when they fail. Where I come from, we call that a frame job. Hedlund also wanted to examine oppression. What would happen when you have a small group whose worldview, philosophy, beliefs, lifestyle are in direct opposition to the culture at large? How might that play out? Lots of inspirations for that topic, just sticking with American history. Puritans and Quakers, religious and political dissidents who were forced to flee England, ended up being the foundation of America. The Germans who were rounded up during World War I. Japanese rounded up during World War II. Or you could even go to the 60s and 70s and the persecution some hippie groups faced in various places around America. And there's the obvious one, the oppression Native Americans faced and continue to face. Did they use these or any number of other examples as inspiration for their story? Nah. They chose to be inspired by the witch trials of Northern Europe in the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance. We have another example of Hedlund and her writers operating in bad faith. They aren't interested in telling stories about oppression. They're more interested in relitigating old debunked feminist arguments about feminine power versus masculine power. Agenda, agenda, agenda. By focusing on a conflict between Jedi and witches, Hedlund and her writers are going to have to do a lot of heavy lifting to convince the audience that the Jedi are baddies. Right or wrong, most people perceive witches and witchcraft to be evil. Now that could be an interesting discussion in of itself. The best way to convince people to re-examine their ideas of good and evil is through the use of their own morals and ethics. It's a very powerful way to persuade people. What gave Martin Luther King Jr.'s arguments such power? He challenged the American people 
to reevaluate what's good and what's evil based upon their own morals and ethics. I'm you. We come from the same cultural traditions. We share the same values. I believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All I'm asking, the same opportunity to pursue the American dream like everybody else. The argument worked. Headland and her writers have no interest in this type of persuasion because, again, they're acting in bad faith. They have no interest in examining what is good and what is evil. Their goal, to completely throw out the concepts of good and evil. They're regurgitating the old feminist and Marxist, same thing, arguments that concepts of good and evil are subjective. It's all about power and who's allowed to wield it. In her attempt to make the witches and the Sith sympathetic and the Jedi repugnant, Hedlund wants us as the audience to reject the very concepts of good and evil. But there's a problem. Those without morals and ethics speak a very different language than those who have morals and ethics. It's very difficult for the two groups to communicate. You can convince somebody to reevaluate their morals and ethics, Martin Luther King Jr., but it's very difficult to convince somebody to abandon their morals and ethics. There is a way. It's actually a very good way, time-tested and proven. You erode somebody's morals and ethics. Very few people are willing to make the classic deal with the devil, sell their soul for some sort of immediate gain. So what you do, you nibble around the edges. A little compromise here, a little compromise there. And slowly over time, one day the person wakes up and realizes and they no longer have morals and ethics. Sound familiar, Leslie Headland? There are two key components to this approach. First, the person giving up their morals and ethics have to be a willing participant. They have to feel like every time they give up one of their principles, they're getting something of value. Second, this method takes time. You're slowly nibbling around the edges. You don't want the people you're targeting to realize their morals and ethics are under attack. Otherwise, they just might stop engaging in the transaction with you. The acolytes approach, throw out your morals and ethics and agree with us. Otherwise, you're a bad person. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If there's no good and evil, how can I be bad? Shut up, bigot. Stop thinking. Stop using logic. Logic is racist, heteronormative, and all that other bad stuff that reinforces the patriarchy. Agree with us or you're a bad person. Yeah, that approach isn't persuasive, but it's a real good way to pick a fight, a fight you're going to lose. The acolyte makes the argument that the witches, Ocean May, and the Sith in general are good, and the Jedi, in particular Master Soul, are evil. If we have traditional morals and ethics, what do we have to overlook in the story as presented to accept this proposition? We are presented a group of witches by their own admission are hiding from the Galactic Republic and the Jedi because what they do is considered to be unnatural, a perversion, forbidden and illegal. If they are caught, they risk death. Right off the bat, the writers are putting the audience in a position where they have to make a choice. Are these witches innocent victims who are being persecuted just because they choose to live outside of society's norms? Or, on the other hand, are these some evil sons of bitches that deserve death? The witches' every word and action are now under a microscope. In my critiques of episodes 7 and 8, I talked about all the mental gymnastics the writers had to go through in adherence to ideological rules. The short version, the Jedi are evil. Look how diverse we made the Jedi! The foundation of the storytelling is the representational elements of each character and group. The show goes out of its way to tell us that Ocean May have two mothers. And look, look over here, everybody, look, do you get a good look? They're lesbians. In fact, the identity of the entire coven is based around their lesbianism. So what? We have a group of women who happen to be lesbians. Who cares, right? 
Well, tell them, animal. This is another example of where Hedlund and her writer's insistence on sacrificing storytelling on the altar of agenda has come back to bite them in the ass. They could have portrayed Dark Side of the Force users, the Sith, in any way they wanted, but they insisted on portraying them as a witch coven. Remember my number one rule. Every design decision is a conscious choice. It's meant to be that way. So what's the problem? It's very common for most forms of witchcraft to incorporate sexuality into their rituals. When the four Jedi enter the lesbian witch coven's fortress for the first time, they disrupt a witch ritual in progress, where the witch coven is forcing two eight-year-old girls to participate in one of their rituals against the will of one of the girls. Why are these girls participating in a witch ritual, one of them against her will? They're being raised to become the lesbian witch coven's leaders. That raises all sorts of icky questions. Now, we have to acknowledge all witch ceremonies aren't sexual. So which type is it? Again, we as the audience are being put in a position where we have to decide, are the witches innocent victims of oppression or are they evil incarnate? The ceremony is now under a microscope. To figure out what type of ceremony we're dealing with, we have to look at the meaning, its symbolism. Let's start by examining where the ceremony takes place. In front of a large hole in the ground, an oval-shaped hole with a structure at the top of the oval. Natural sites with obvious sexual imagery are used in fertility rituals. I keep saying, if you're going to mess around with symbolism, you better know what you're doing, because this one is about as on the nose as you can get. Now we look at the ritual itself. A lot of people, rightfully so, have made fun of the stupid singing, but pay attention to the hand gestures. It looks an awful lot like a fertility ritual. How are the girls being treated during the ceremony? They're being worshipped by the coven. Oh, that's normal. That's healthy. How is the ceremony described? Sold to the girls, one of them against their will, and by extension, us, the audience. It's called the Ascension Ceremony, where you sacrifice a part of yourself to become a member of the group. As I talked about in my critique of episode 3, there are a number of religious traditions from around the world, including witchcraft, that describe intercourse in the exact same language. In particular, female intercourse is described as sacrificing a part of herself, giving of herself to the other. Female orgasm is described as ascending to another plane. All of this is done in an exchange of power. So let me get this straight. A lesbian witch coven is demanding that two eight-year-old girls, one of them against her will, participate in a fertility ceremony in front of sexual imagery. These two eight-year-old girls are expected to sacrifice a part of themselves to ascend so that the coven can become more powerful. Good guys, my ass. Which is evil? Check. Now what about the Jedi? We're supposed to believe the Jedi were the aggressors. They had no reason to come into the fortress, and they just slaughtered the witches just because. The writing is so stupid. Once Soul senses the fire, senses Osha's in danger, everything that led up to that point becomes irrelevant. From this point forward, everything the Jedi do is justified, and everything the witches do is straight up evil. Remember, the Jedi have said, we will be back to let you know what the council has decided. The witches know the Jedi are coming. That's why May trashes the elevator to keep them out. The Jedi are in the witches' fortress because they're trying to save Osha from a fire. The witches are actively preventing the Jedi from saving Osha, even after when May comes running into the courtyard screaming, I need help. It's almost like the witches are trying to kill Osha. Makes you wonder where May learned the idea, if you try to leave us, we'll kill you. If you're trying to save a child from a fire and somebody comes along and tries to prevent you from saving that child, 
You're justified in using force against that person so you can save the child. On a side note, the symbolism isn't lost. The evil man, master soul, his phallic object becoming erect, stabbing into the representative of feminine power, Mother Anastasia, and killing her? Not one member of the Jedi team did anything wrong, much less did anything deserving of death. Master Soul was trying to save Osha from a fire, thought he was protecting May from an evil smoke demon going, Aah! Torben, he didn't harm one witch. All he did was defend himself from the witch's attacks. The Wookiee, all he did, have his mind taken over, forced to attack his friends against his will. Master Trinity, all she did was force the witches out of the Wookiee's mind. There's some confusion if in the process the witches died. If somebody prevents you from using your powers to take over somebody's mind, make them do things against their will, and in that process you die? Sorry about your bad luck. For a show that's supposed to be a feminist manifesto, almost every woman in it is evil. I already talked about the witches. Master Trinity, she covered up something the Jedi were justified in doing because apparently it would make her look bad. Master Nepo, she was prepared to put an innocent person, Osha, in jail for a crime she didn't commit because politics. And then she covered up the murder of four innocent Jedi by evil Dark Force users. She framed one of the innocent victims for the crime. May's actions, starting the fire, led to the deaths of an undisclosed number of witches and almost killed her own sister. May never took responsibility for her actions, blamed everybody else, including the Jedi. And then she went and hunted down innocent people to kill them. Osha. She's a real piece of work. She turned to the dark side, murdered in cold blood the man who saved her life, all because she believed a sister who refused to take responsibility for what she'd done. What the acolyte is trying to do is called value scrambling. You manipulate and twist ideas to the point where people no longer have an idea what's good and what's evil, right or wrong. They end up throwing up their hands and walking away from morality entirely. Ironically, these incompetent buffoons didn't convince me to abandon the concepts of good and evil. On the other hand, what they did accomplish, they reminded me why I choose to stay as far as humanly possible from people with no morality. Like I said earlier, those who don't believe in good and evil struggle to communicate with those who do believe in good and evil. They're not talking the same language. They struggle to communicate. That's why when one group makes an argument that they think is persuasive, they don't understand why the other group laughs in their face. All I got to say, season two, please, please. Leslie Headland has said the acolyte is her greatest work of art. Leslie, sister, have you considered accounting? Because very clearly, art isn't the profession for you. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, you all be safe. If you all are still here, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And while you're at it, feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.